So our next uh, speaker is Adam Eldam from Boissy uh, University and the Collège de France. Uh, he uh, trained in Istanbul uh, and then received his doctorate at the Université uh, de Provence in Aix-Marseille. Uh, Aix He's taught uh, at Boissy uh, since 1989 and since uh, 2017 holds the International Chair of Turkish and Ottoman History at the Collège de France. He's taught at Berkeley, Harvard, Columbia, um, at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, uh, has been a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. He's worked on a variety of topics such as the Levant trade, funerary epigraphy, the Imperial Ottoman Bank, Orientalism and Westernization, Ottoman first-person narratives, Istanbul at the turn of the 20th century, and the history of archaeology, museology, and photography in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, a vast quantity of publication beginning uh, in 1999 with French trade in Istanbul in the 18th century, uh, and concluding um, really most recently two books published in 2018, To Kill a Sultan, A Transnational History of the Attempt on Abu Hamid II in 1905, uh, and uh, L'Empire Ottoman et la Turquie face à l'Occident. Uh, and in between, a range of studies on those topics that I mentioned before, uh, and we're uh, very pleased and fortunate to have him here telling us a little bit about antiquarianism and archaeology in the 19th century in Istanbul. Thank you. Uh, Peter and Abby for this invitation. It's um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, dear medievalist colleagues, I come from the future. Uh, the 19th century, something very different. Um, and that's why I'm not using the term antiquarianism. I'm using context because I think uh, that one of the ways of dealing with this is to look at what I consider to be one of the essential elements of um, the distinction between, as Alain Schnapp just said, curiosité and ingéniosité, and I think it's context, that is, putting objects, texts, whatever, in uh, to a form of context that makes sense and that builds towards a historical narrative and some kind of a historical um, knowledge. Um, I also avoid the term antiquarianism because uh, by the 19th century, and especially by the 1830s, 40s, uh, the term is passé. The term refers to something that has been, that reached some kind of a climax, you might say, at the turn of the 19th century with uh, this uh, um, obsession, especially the craze, if you want, for antiquities uh, that hits the Ottoman Empire, uh, Greece, uh, Asia Minor, um, Egypt, uh, with the expedition of 1798. Um, but uh, by the 20s, 30s, 40s, the the term is no longer used. It is gradually replaced by disciplinary uh, uh, definitions of uh, specialization. And in fact, they're used, the, the term is starts to be used even with a derogatory uh, context, connotation of something that's somewhat passé and not very reliable, quaint at best, uh, but not really um, a science. I'm also not using it because many people have used it in an Ottoman context. And I've come to the conclusion that antiquarianism is in the eyes of the scholar. And uh, if you look for it, if you really want to find antiquarianism, you will have plenty of examples that will confirm a bit your you know, your wishful thinking uh, in the direction of identifying one or another author, one or another uh, uh, collector, one or another polymath as being an antiquarian. And of course, uh, the point uh, is going to be to compare him, her, not many hers, um, with uh, European equivalents at the time. So I'm going to start with a quote, and that's a very palimpsestic, antiquarian way of treating my colleagues and, 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 and friends. I'm quoting from Marinos uh, Sariannis, quoting um, 
um, uh, Gottfried Hagen uh, from Ann Arbor, so these are contemporaries, everybody's alive, so it's, you know, um, in a context that is related to what we're talking about, uh, we mentioned the Ajaib and Garaib uh, tradition, and the Ottomans have a lot of that, and it's an interesting statement where, um, you know, Mariano Sarianis, uh, talking about Ajaib and Garaib, uh, is using a reference, is using a quote from uh, Gottfried Hagen, who uses it in a context, in the context of Ottoman geographic uh, um, work, where he says, and I quote, we have to avoid an approach which tends to a continuous comparison of Ottoman and European science. Ottoman science is good as far as it imitates Europe, whereas autochton uh, developments are exam examples of backwardness in the worst cause case uh, caused by religious fanaticism. This you could turn over and say that, as as I just mentioned, um, the moment you want to find a similarity, the moment you want to uh, restore some kind of a dignity to the Ottomans because you feel they have been wronged by Orientalism and whatever, you will find examples of good Ottomans that participate in that universal um, uh, work of antiquarianism, and uh, that has been done. But that is, as I said, for the early modern period. In the 19th century, things are a little more complicated, and therefore I'm looking at context. And I have singled out for you know, purposes of clarity and simplicity, three contexts, three ways in which I can look at the contextual, the contextualization of material, material evidence, be it textual or uh, inscriptions or coins or books or whatever, um, in the 19th century. The first is what I call traditional or traditional list. Um, the second is going to be oriental, Ist, and the third is going to be modern ist, so it rhymes, uh, which is also in the tradition of antiquarianism. And I'll start with um, an, a, a traveler, uh, a traveler to Constantinople, a traveler to the Ottoman Empire, but to Constantinople, whom I like particularly uh, because he has a very vivid and very detailed description of Constantinople, of Istanbul, in 1844. You know, uh, Charles White, a British officer, a colonel, uh, who talks about um, three years in Constantinople in 1844. And as you can see from the frontispiece, you know, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim in, in a Tura form, there's a lot of Orientalism, but a claim to be in sync with the culture that he's visiting. And what I find particularly um, interesting is the way in which he describes uh, the economic center of, uh, of Istanbul, the Grand Bazaar, with respect to objects that we associate with antiquarianism or with antiquities or with <coughs> things uh, related. And he has a map of the Grand Bazaar, a very good map. I mean, if you compare it to uh, present-day maps, you can see that it's rather accurate, where he identifies uh, seven major points where antiquities are being sold. Uh, this is a very broad term he's using. Uh, it goes from, uh, from uh, seals to, uh, uh, to little, uh, uh, to jewels, uh, from books uh, to whatever you can imagine that falls within the major category of, um, of uh, antiquities. But uh, when he talks about uh, who buys this material, you soon realize that it's mostly uh, foreigners. I mean, you get a sense of the Great Bazaar. If you've been to Istanbul in the past 10, 20, 30 years, you will know exactly what it looks like. You know, you uh, the carpet, the, uh, the carpets, whatever oriental stuff tourists are interested in is available there. And you get a sense that the major audience for this is uh, the, um, the, the Western uh, 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 traveler. He has an interesting statement, which I, uh, I have copied here verbatim, but what I underline or write in red is that he uh, claims that the Ottomans, the Turks, obviously, uh, find no charms in the rust of antiquity or in preserving the picturesque mosque of bygone 
days, and they have a contempt for antiques, which is a way of saying they are exactly the contrary of the antiquarian. They have a tendency to whitewash everything. They will whitewash the, um, uh, the polychrome decorations of their mosques and whatever. They will renew everything uh, and have no respect, no interest, no passion for uh, the palimpsest, which we think is so interesting in terms of uh, layering out the, um, uh, the history of certain uh, objects. Now, lexicography is one way of dealing with this notion. And I've done my lexicographic uh, uh, research into the possible terms that one can think of uh, in the context of, the, uh, of Ottoman Turkish culture, um, looking at, first of all, what is called old, and you have basically three terms that can be used. Eski is Turkish, so that's the most vulgar, quote-unquote, and it's kind of something you wouldn't use if you want to value uh, an, an object. You have Atik, which is Arabic, obviously, and Kadim. Atik is something that goes in the direction of old, rather, uh, in a rather neutral way. Kadim has a sense of something that has a prestigious kind of, of, uh, of age, and therefore is closest to what I would call ancient in, um, in, in the civilized uh, languages. Okay, so, um, but then, it, there's an interesting test that can be done, which is to look at one of the major sources of material culture in the Ottoman Empire, which is um, uh, probate inventories, inventories after de death. I'm not a specialist. I haven't gone through all the series, but what I've seen of them makes me uh, claim that the terms that come most that appear most in such inventories are not Kadim and Atik, which would come with some kind of a glorification of the object, but Kohne, which is from the Persian, Kohne, which is old, but really with a sense of dilapidated, something that is uh, worn out. And uh, Mustamel, which in Arabic means used, second hand. Uh, a very practical way of saying that whatever you're seeing in that uh, inventory has been used and therefore has lost uh, some of its value as anything second or third hand uh, would. And therefore, uh, it seems interesting that it's only in the 1840s, at the time when um, White is writing, uh, that the Ottomans come up, or at least that the Europeans come up with terms that might be a translation of antiquity and of antiquarianism. And the first example, the best example, is Hanjiri, Prince Hanjiri's, uh, Alexander Hanjiri's uh, uh, three-volume um, um, dictionary, where from French to Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, where uh, you see this very quaint way in which he uses, first, a paraphrase that is extremely vulgar, quote-unquote, in the sense that it uses uh, good old Turkish to basically give a sense of what antiquity is by saying things remaining from olden times. I've noticed that all you medievalists and specialists of Arabic literature, as an Ottoman, I don't speak Arabic. That's uh, that's part of uh, of the uh, the prestige of being an Ottoman. You don't, but you can pretend, you know, Arabic. You know, it's a, um, and uh, I've noticed that whenever you talk about ruins, remains, you use Athar. whereas for the Ottomans, Asad alone has no meaning in that would go in that direction, which is why Khanjeri adds kadime, the plural of kadim, to specify that these are traces of the past. So, and, and this is a very important step because the Ottomans will take that as their official way of rendering antiquities after they create their museum, their first museum in 1846. They will, however, take uh, atik, instead of Kadim, call it Asada Atika. But at the same time, they are also using 
antica, which comes obviously from the Italian. And there's a very nice quote in uh, White who describes the way in which the shop owners in the bazaar try to attract uh, the Western traveler. And I quote, it's, Signor, Signor Capitano, um, che volete? Antica, antica. So it's, you know, the, 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 the typical uh, uh, lingua franca of the Levant put to use to uh, defining curiosities that are attractive to the Western uh, visitor and that are called Antica. So that's how it makes its way before Asad Antica into Turkish. But what's very sweet or cute or interesting um, is that you find it very often misspelled with an Ein. Because of the similarity, the near homophony with, uh, with Atik, Atika. And that's very typical of, uh, Turkish culture, Turkish Ottoman culture, in the sense that because you're not mastering, uh, Italian or Arabic, you end up mixing the two in some kind of a sabir that will give you a latitude as to the use of certain terms to describe what you are, uh, talking about. So from this, I deduce that um, the notion of ancient uh, or antiquity is, quote-unquote, an acquired taste, something that comes with modernity, with the creation of the museum, with the idea that a museum and that collections and that using artifacts as a source of information uh, regarding history is something that comes with a civilizational checklist of the 1840s. And, of course, this is a very, very superficial, very marginal phenomenon, because contrary to what has been said, uh, the Ottoman museal uh, adventure is a flop. It's a major flop. That is, they will build a museum, but there will be no visitors. There will be no catalog. I mean, it's the ideal museum, you might say, from the perspective of a curator, uh, you know. Um, but there's no order, no catalog, no visitors, and no outlet, no dissipation, diffusion of that information into the spheres, public, intellectual, whatever. And this is true until the 1900s. I mean, uh, even under Osman Hamdi, whom we praise as the founding father of the real museum after 1881 and whatever, uh, Osman Hamdi is a specialist of the MT Museum. It's a museum that is uh, that has only one mission, which is that of satisfying the expectations of Westerners to be visited by Westerners and to prove that the Ottomans can have a museum and that they are able to compete with the museums of Paris, London, and Berlin and that they can have the real thing in Istanbul. That does not mean that there is an opening towards the local uh, public. So let's look at some cases of how the, te the, uh, the historical material is treated by the Ottomans based on, again, not uh, exceptions, but something that really can be, uh, can be inserted in some kind of a traditionalist uh, path, a pattern. One example that I find interesting is a Hatta Humayun, an imperial decree, 1820 by Mahmoud II, who talks about the renovation of a mosque in Kadikoy. And what he says is this, there is no need to compose a chronogram for the holy mosque. It is not appropriate to destroy the remains of its builder, Sultan Mustafa. This is a mosque from the 18th century. Just have a nice tura, mine, of course, is what he means, drawn to be placed on marble over the entrance. So you would imagine that there's some kind of a respect for the palimpsest, for the layering of... And yet, when you look at the actual... Uh, uh, situation of this mosque, you realize that not only is it not even Mahmoud's uh, um, uh, Tura, it's his son, Abdul Majid's, with a very long inscription that kind of erases completely previous, it does quote Mustafa, but it presents the mosque as a um, um, uh, an achievement of the present sultan. So it goes a little bit in the direction of what White criticized so uh, clearly about the Ottomans, the whitewashing of the past uh, by the addition of a new layer that obliterates, in a sense, uh, the previous historic uh, uh, texture. Now, 
1826, as you probably know, is this incredible date, the revolution from above, the destruction of the Janissary Corps. This is the occasion for um, a discovery of a relic, but an Ottoman relic, uh, because, I mean, the Ottomans are obviously into Islamic relics, but this is an interesting case of the very helpful discovery of the blood-stained garments of Sultan Osman II, who was murdered at the age of 18 in 1622 by the Janissaries. So, again, by this incredible coincidence, at a time when the Sultan has decided to destroy the Janissaries, they discover the blood-stained uh, um, garments of, the, um, of, of, uh, of a martyr, an ancestor martyr, and this becomes, as you can see in the text, um, um, uh, a, a way for Mahmoud to publicize and spread his revenge to uh, the elite, the ruling elite of the time. So he examined the package with much grief. He ordered it to be taken to the Grand Vizier and the ministers in order to have them share his outrage and anger against the Janissaries, which this site had ignited uh, even more. So there you have, again, an instrumentalization for political uh, uh, reasons of an object that suddenly becomes a political relic, a dynastic political uh, relic. Now, um, in 1856, I found this document which, you know, uh, the 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 catalog of the Ottoman archives is uh, very performant. I mean, uh, I've uh, introduced it to uh, some friends, Kornad, for example. It works very well, so you can have immediately online an idea of what the document is uh, about. And this document looked very promising because in 1856, suddenly in Bursa, the Ottomans, because they're looking for some kind of a location to set up an office, find in an abandoned garden, an orchard they find instruments of the mint, the imperial mint that was used by the early sultans in Bursa in probably the 14th century. And therefore, uh, I immediately pounced on this, you know, thinking this was finally one example where you would see some kind of the construction of a dynastic story of respect towards the other. And then you realize that, yes, they do say take all these objects, bring them to Istanbul, place them in the imperial mint to show how incredibly evolved our present-day technology is for the, uh, for the minting of coins. So it's exactly the reverse. You're not longing for the past. You're using uh, the past in order to contrast it with the perfection of the present, again, in this weird way, uh, uh, re rejecting or, or refusing um, a past uh, layer. So this traditionalist uh, um, context is something that you can follow. I can give you uh, plenty of examples. These are, you know, good examples that give you a sense that it's always about relics with a touch of magic. Uh, the, the, uh, the keys of the Kaaba, uh, um, five pairs of, you know, the Yemen. You, we talked about Yemen and Marib. Look at that. I mean, five pairs of antelopes and some very strange and very old antiques called Antica here, from among the antiquities, Asar Antica, I love this ambiguity. So, antiques from antiquities, uh, obtained and purchased from Merib, the city of Sheba. Or, in 1889, a, a, a Quran from Cordoba is presented to the Sultan. In 1895, a French entrepreneur sells for 5,000 pounds, liras, um, a letter by the prophet. And in 1900, they find a copy of the Pact of Omar uh, buried in the wall of one monastery near uh, Gallipoli. All of these really build up towards a very traditional way in which these objects are defined essentially as traces of the Islamic past and something that comes and consolidates the role of Abdul Hamid in uh, most of the cases as the caliph of Islam. Uh, this goes as far as the famous, for archaeologists, seal of Shema that was discovered in 1904 by uh, Schumacher, a German archaeologist, and which has disappeared. And the reason why it has disappeared is that the 
governor of Beirut had the good idea to send it to Abdul Hamid himself, knowing that he would appreciate it. So from that point on, we lose track of it. It was sent to the palace, and then nobody knows what uh, what happened to it. But obviously, this being a, a, a seal that is... Uh, linked to biblical history and to Jeroboam, this is a typical example of something that is talismanic, uh, an amulet-like object that acquires great uh, value in the eyes of the Ottomans and especially of the Sultan to the point of being retrieved, taken away from what should have been its normal recipient, the Imperial Museum. Second uh, context uh, Orientalism. And here, obviously, Osman Hamdi is going to be the hero or one of the most representative characters, uh, actors in, in this process. And this is a painting by him, which has disappeared, so we only have the photograph, 1880, which represents him in his studio. Uh, and you can see that the studio is pretty much, you know, an Orientalist studio, something that would look like the, the studio of Jérôme in Paris, or the um, um, uh, the living room of somebody like Rench, uh, the, friend, the uh, British consul in Istanbul, who was a great collector of all sorts of Rhodian Persian tiles, meaning Iznik tiles, because they still aren't recognized as being uh, local. But before that, I think it's interesting to see that this Orientalist twist comes also with what I consider to be a major problem in Ottoman history, which is the lumping of everything Islamic under the same category when there are, I think, enormous differences. And one of the divides I would insist on is that between the Turks, quote-unquote, I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about language, and the Arabs. And to illustrate this, I'm going to use uh, something that I recently published in a, in a very long article on the Alhambra, the Ottomans visiting the Alhambra. I dis discovered like, you know, 150 um, Ottomans, Muslims, Orientals visiting the Alhambra. And this was triggered by this photograph of a certain Jawad uh, Khalil um, al um, Khalidi, of the Khalidi family, um, you know, Rashid Khalidis and whatever. And, um, and this is a fascinating photograph because, I mean, it's not the Alhambra. It is a photographic studio next to the Alhambra where uh, where uh, Garzon, Rafael Garzon, took photos of tourists in Oriental garb. So here you have an Oriental in his real Oriental garb posing in this fake patio of the Alhambra. But what's interesting is that on the back of this photograph, there's a dedication to a friend of his with an inscription that he claims has, uh, uh, has inscribed in the visitor's book of the Alhambra, where he uses a poem, a poem in Arabic, and again a reference to an Ashnap, I have discovered, thanks to people who knew something about uh, this, this context, contrary to me, that this was a rehash of a poem from the 11th century, which is a lament over the loss of Madinat to Zahra. And the beauty of it is that as Zahra, Al-Hamra, they rhyme and they can be interchanged. And that. But what's interesting is that this Arab, he is an Arab, he is a Maktisi, he is from, from, um, from uh, Jerusalem. He knows he has some kind of a reference. And obviously, if you dig into that visitor's book, you will find that Ahmad Zaki, the famous intellectual, Egyptian intellectual, was there only 10 years before him and used very similar verses, again referring to um, al Sumaisir and Nasiruddin, um, uh, Nasirullah, uh, something, a uh, caliph, uh, who was also a poet, um, again, I'm, you know, 19th century, um, uh, a, a, a poet uh, who lamented over all this. Now, if you want to, oops, that is not normal. What did I do? Oh, God. You control me. Wow. That's not me. That's not me. That's still not me. Uh, I'm, it, mine is a PDF. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can you enlarge it? While. 
on, on, on the right, the, uh, the full screen thing? Huh, okay. Uh, okay. You know, uh, so let's compare this with an Ottoman Turkish visitor to the Alhambra who went four years before Khalidi, a certain uh, Hilmi Bey, in fact, Tunali Hilmi, for those who know young Turk history, he's a major uh, figure, and look at him posing in the same studio. On the left, he's posing as a globetrotter with a, uh, with a, uh, with a suitcase, and the detail, I've looked it up, the detail in his hands, he's holding the Bedeker for Spain and Portugal. And on the right, he's posing as Chorohumo, the prince of the Gitanos, the prince of the Gypsies. That is, he's using uh, Spanish folklore to fashion himself into what he thinks is an appropriate way of posing in that context. And this is accompanied in the, uh, the visitor's book by the rambling thoughts of a young Turk who knows nothing about the Alhambra, but can make a comparison between the hilltop of the Alhambra and the hilltop of Abdul Hamid's palace, Yildiz, and say, look at Alhambra, it has fallen, yours will fall too. No historical context whatsoever, completely clueless. And if you look at all these visitors, Ottoman visitors, it's very clear. The Turks are clueless, at best, they get some information in the Bedeker and kind of translate it into the, the visitor's book because the Spanish want them to say something uh, meaningful about the ruins. Uh, whereas the Arabs, be it Ahmad Zaki, be it all sorts of Arabs from the Mashrek, they are capable of recycling some poetry, some cultural references uh, for uh, the purposes of lamenting over the Alhambra. So when the Ottomans in the 1860s discovered the joys of Orientalism of Moresque architecture, as in the case of this famous, they do so not through their own experience of the Moresque, but through Owen Jones, through Ludwig von Zand, through uh, the architect of this, this horror, which still stands in Bayezid Square, which is a French architect by the name of Bourgeois. You know, it's, 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 it's horrible. So that's it. No revivalism. It's just that it looks pretty, it looks modern, and it looks oriental. Therefore, you can use it as an identifier, but you don't know where it comes from. People tell you that, look, this is oriental. It will fit your, um, your uh, uh, purposes. Now, Osman Hamdi, therefore, is part and parcel of this Orientalist view of Islamic artifacts. And um, uh, um, uh, Theodore Bent, who hated him, has a description of his home where he says, you know, there's a wonderful medley of works of art, Rhodian faience, those are the Isniks, Eastern embroideries, tiles and cases with choice Tanagra figures and other treasures of Greek art. In short, His Excellency collects everything that delights the heart of a bric a brac collector. So that's what Osman Hamdi is. And if you look at his uh, studio, that's what it is. It is a European bric a brac that speaks of the Orient, but has no real content, no real context uh, with respect to these uh, objects. And this is what he does in his own painting. He recycles a very limited number of objects, like a Jérôme, which are typically uh, oriental, and therefore give to his paintings that taste of exoticism, which his uh, customers want, because he sells and exhibits only in Europe. So you can see the repetition of this, uh, this helmet or of these Mamluk lambs over and over again in all his paintings. So I've done the network analysis of the distribution of these objects in his painting, and you can see how it goes from one to another throughout almost 30 years of career without ever changing. So that's how he works. Now, this guy is also head of the Imperial Museum. But the Imperial Museum, of course, this is the, uh, the climax, if you want, of his antiquarian or pseudo-antiquarian uh, uh, oriental painting, orientalist painting. It is this painting, which he calls Genesis, which represents a 
a slightly pregnant woman sitting on a rech- on a rachle, uh, her back to a mihrab with all sorts of books uh, 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 strewn uh, around the, the floor. Now, the mihrab, we know, is part of the Imperial Museum's collections, one of the first objects to be recuperated from Anatolia as part of the new series, the new collection of um, Islamic objects. And the books... The books are Qurans. I mean, you can't read it, but you can see it from uh, the way they're, they're designed. And some, interestingly, are very specifically named the Zend Avesta. Why? No idea, but he thought probably that it was appropriate. Or the Sakyamuni. So he's, he's doing some kind of a collage of Oriental uh, objects, Oriental books, uh, trampled by a pregnant woman. So it's kind of scandalous, but obviously since he's not exhibiting in in the Ottoman Empire, nobody cares. And in the West, nobody gets it. So, you know, he's uh, he's kind of navigating between these two uh, uh these two worlds. And the 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 climax is to know that the woman is is, is inspired from Jérôme's Tanagra, uh, uh which is um um a famous uh, po- uh polychromous uh, um um statue that he produced in 1889. So that's Oswan Hamdi as an artist using Islamic artifacts as part of this fashioning of his art as something oriental, uh, which is his trademark, the way in which he uh, fools the Western audiences into believing that he's giving them the real Orient, as opposed to Jérôme who gives a false Orient. Now, interestingly, as I said, he's also head of the museum, but his museum is about the Greco-Roman, Mesopotamian, even Egyptian uh, collections, not about Islamic collections, at least not at the beginning. In fact, in a letter to Theodore Renac, he talks about something that is located inside the museum, which is this uh, nice little uh, Persianate, you might say, uh, um, um, fountain uh, in the middle of the, the tiled kiosk from the 16th century, and this is what he says about it. Ah, it's of no importance. Uh, it's, it just gives you the date of the construction. He's not into this material. For, for him, this is decorative material. He will use it as a decor for a painting, and we have photographs of inside that kiosk where you can see that Roman uh, statues, Egyptian stuff, are all piled up together, lumped in a chaotic manner, and that famous um, uh, uh, fountain is called Fontaine Orientale, you know, in, in the middle of Istanbul, and in the middle of it you have some kind of a Buddha statue, which one Ottoman uh, um, uh, captain brought back from Thailand uh, a few years earlier, and that was, you know, shoved into the collection of the, uh, of the, the museum. In 1885, they do come up with the need to create an, uh, an, uh, um, an Islamic collection. For that, they kind of pick up whatever is more or less endangered in the collections of the mosques and imarets and medreses and whatever in Istanbul. So that's the beginning, and it's a very Orientalist kind of collection, which is safely tucked away uh, on the second floor of the museum. Nobody visits it anyway. So uh, it's just a performa kind of, of uh, desire to tick again Islamic art because Islamic art has started to become uh, part of the way in which the West is also looking at this uh, geography. The same is happening in the palace of Topkapı, which is gradually being museified, and it's museified in this weird way of basically a bric a brac again of European clocks with Ottoman uh, uh, um, weapons, uh, one throne, the famous uh, Nadia Shah uh, uh, throne, uh, encased in, in uh, glass, Sevres porcelain, it's a mishmash. And of course, the series of, uh, of garments that are uh, associated supposedly with uh, the uh, dynastic uh, series, that is the clothes of the sultans. Now, Last, the modernist context, and I think the best way to illustrate that is this fantastic photograph of Ottoman officers pretending to study Ottoman uh, weapons. 
right? I mean, it, that's, there's no other way you can explain this. And this is the, the, the last stage, if you want, realizing that it's no longer just acculturation. It's no longer just looking at your own objects as being quaint, exotic, and whatever, but that you need to integrate them into some kind of a historic context. This is when the Ottomans start to invent, reinvent their dynastic myth uh, and look at ways in which Bursa Sud and whatever the origins of the uh, Ottoman dynasty can be uh, promoted to a central uh, kind of position in the grand narrative. But these, um, um, the museum becomes the place where this is going to be performed. And on paper, it's all there. That is, you have everything from natural history to uh, Islamic to Byzantine to whatever that is included in the way in which the museum is supposed to be redefined after 1889 and after 1894 with the creation of the Islamic section. And this is what the Islamic section looks like. You know, it's really a very minimal uh, kind of collection. And most of the objects are absolutely not contextualized. They are decorative objects that are lined up in these uh, cases. They remind you of that famous publication by a certain Huckabade. We know nothing about this guy, but this guy is somebody who enters the market proposing Islamic objects, constantly comparing collections in the West with his own collection and therefore promoting his collection to be sold uh, in the West. Miroir de l'art musulman. That's uh, his take. So, in 1892, that's when you understand that the state is taking things um, uh, seriously. There are today many remains throughout the imperial domain, such as mosques, mausoleums, public buildings, fountains, etc., built by the Celtic sovereigns and by contemporary rulers in Anatolia, in the areas of Karaman, Aydin, Mentish, and Saruhan, as well as coins, you know, clueless, but, you know, interested, um, all of which bear all sorts of names and titles. These should be preserved, and if they should be in ruins, those antiquities that are scattered here and there and are deemed worthy of display should be uh, sent to the Imperial Museum. I'll skip this long uh, definition that Hadil Etem, Osman Hamdi's brother, gives of the rise of Islamic art after the collapse of Europe, thanks to the rise of Arab history, of the Arab culture, and then the Ottomans taking up uh, the uh, that that following suit, it's a long uh, kind of defense, if you want, of the necessity to contextualize Islamic art as part of the grand narrative of Ottoman history and as part of the museum, and it is based on a very simplistic kind of uh, uh, logic, which is that of museums equal civilization. That's the starting point ever since the 1840s. That's the Ottomans have this very quaint and cute way of admitting Barbary by basically saying, this is how it's done in civilized countries. You know, which is self-admission of, you know, and that's how they justify museums. And then Europe has many uh, museums, down to the smallest town. Uh, we have always preserved objects in sacred buildings, so we have done this differently in mosques, in medrasas, and whatever. Our predecessors have always collected objects and preserved them well. Poverty, now we have the economic uh, thing that comes in. Poverty has recently started to replace local crafts with imported goods. We have lost our taste and started to discard old objects. Our homes have come to the point where they have no character. Europeans have started discovering the beauty of uh, Islamic arts, and they have started looting Anatolia and whatever. Underpaid and corrupt employees have contributed to the plunder. European mu museums are now filled with manuscripts, carpets, and tiles. So it's about time that we prevent this by preempting this move, and we will have a new museum, and that's the 1914 Aukaf, Efkaf Museum, will save the remaining objects from loss and destruction. And this is what the museum looks. It still looks like its earlier version in the Imperial Museum, but it draws a lot on one of the most concrete examples of a a good museum of Islamic art at, at the time, which is the Berlin Museum. And it's no coincidence because the inspiration, the mastermind behind this, apart from Halil Etem, is Friedrich Zare, who says, 
and this is an image of the, the, the Islamic Museum in uh, Berlin, the new museum of Mohammedan art in the Turkish capital is a sign of serious scientific endeavors in modern Turkey. He should know because it's his project, it's his way of forcing the Ottomans into rethinking their past and integrating their own culture into the grand narrative of history. So that's it. No antiquarianism, very little context, or context that is generally tributary of something that is happening in uh, the West, either Orientalism or a modernist view of Islamic objects as being part of the, uh, of, of the heritage. Last point, what I have avoided is to talk about non-Muslims. And that's a problem. I haven't talked about non-Islamic artifacts. As I said, because the museum is some kind of a civilizational prop, it doesn't really matter to talk about these objects. But when you talk about antiquarianism, collectors, and amateur archaeologists, it is among the non-Muslim population that you will find them. Are they not Ottomans? Do we not include them by labeling this antiquarianism as part of an Islamic tradition or not? We are avoiding, especially in the 19th century, the rise of a new scientific curiosity among Greeks, especially, but Armenians and Jews in the Ottoman Empire, who want to contribute to the new revival, the modernity of the country, by uh, uh, by their own archaeological, historical, and cultural contribution. This has not been studied because it always falls between the cracks, between the Islamic, the ob obsession with Ottoman equals Islam, and the obsession of Europe versus the Orient. They cannot fit any of these, um, uh, these, uh, these categories and therefore fall through the cracks. So my last reminder is that that we should also think of what is happening among the non-Muslims, even if we're talking about an Islamic or Islamicate empire, something uh, that is obviously true in the case of the Ottoman Empire, but does not explain the whole thing if you exclude those parts of the population. Thank you.